What does this and this have to do with gardening? I've had a short or a reel sent to me so many times as I did in the last week about Epsom salt in a spray bottle being sprayed onto plants. Now the question becomes, does it do anything? Well, that's what we're gonna talk about here today. Honest to goodness, I do think some of this is going to shock you because it is going to look at some interesting ideas when it comes to foliar application of fertilizers. And if I sound like a gravelly man that did like a six pack of cigars, it's because I've been snorting rails of soil. I almost said snow. Why Epsom salt? Well, turns out Epsom salt has a relatively high level of magnesium. Now, it can vary from variety to brand and you name it, but the general accepted level is approximately 10.8%. And obviously in this case, you'd be using unscented or no essential oil. Question number one is, are your soils deficient in magnesium? Now this is a twofold question. First off, are you gardening in mineral soil, meaning the soil that's on the ground, or are you growing in potting soil? Well, if you're growing in potting soil, it may be deficient because that's just the nature of a soilless medium. Things tend to drain out a little bit quicker. And I'll be doing a video on how to repurpose your potting soil here shortly and how to get everything kind of recharged and ready to go. Example number two is actual soil. So ground soil, raised beds, you name it. These ones are less likely to be deficient, but there are two Two cases in which we normally see deficiencies outside of intense agriculture, and that is a sandy soil. So a sandy loam to a sandy soil. I was shocked someone sent me a, f a video of their sandy soil over on Instagram, but probably deficient in magnesium. Number two is soils that are acidic. So acidic soils tend to release magnesium super easily, which unfortunately does cause some nutrient deficiencies. For the rest of us in a loam soil, a clay soil, a raised bar garden soil made from, you know, topsoil and compost, we probably aren't deficient in magnesium because we aren't doing intensive agriculture. And then you combine that with the fact that our mineral soil is just jam packed with a lot of the secondary and micronutrients just on its own. However, here's where magnesium gets a little bit weird. Magnesium is one of those nutrients that is not easily uptaken if the soil pH isn't in this range here. So I'm gonna pop an image up on the screen. Wherever the bar is the thickest, that is where magnesium is the most bioavailable. Essentially, as you water more with say alkaline water, so my water source here is a pH of eight, so slowly it's going to increase my soil pH to more alkaline levels. Number two actually has to do with excessive amounts of potassium, also known as potash, which is actually the rock that the potassium comes from, but I digress. I don't know why people call it potash, but they do. That in, in excess can actually cause an imbalance. More, in a lot of cases, is not always better because it can cause an imbalance. And magnesium, unfortunately, is a secondary macro, usually gets bumped out of the photo. But because it's a secondary macro, it's really important for blossom end rot and just overall proper growth. Now, the last kind of grouping of reasons why you would see in a magnesium deficiency actually come down to transplant shock, root damage, uh, roots that are sitting in too much water, so anaerobic conditions, all the way to more of a drought condition where the roots are struggling to uptake water and therefore magnesium. That being said, this year, maybe a year where you start to see more blossom end rot and magnesium deficiencies. And that's often why we coincide improper watering with blossom end rot. There's obviously other stressors with underwatering, but one of the big stressors is that the plants don't get that magnesium that they so desperately need. Question becomes, is your uptake good? Well, in the event that it is good and likely is okay, just a heads up, I don't think many of you have magnesium deficiencies. I've never had anyone send me a photo of a plant where I'm like, oh yeah, no, it's definitely magnesium. It usually has to do with something else. But if you're convinced you have a magnesium deficiency and it's caused by a soil issue and not a watering issue, then you may wanna consider this foliar application because it's gonna be a heck of a lot easier to actually get the nutrients into the plant. We'll talk about that here in a little bit uh, compared to that of the actual 
the soil itself and changing the chemistry of the soil. We'll get into whether or not it needs to be Epsom salt here in a little bit, but anyways, that is option one. Now option two is going to be, does excess magnesium actually help you? Now the answer to that depends on who you ask. Excess magnesium. This is a topic that horticulture, plant science, soil science, really doesn't agree on very well. We do know that excessive magnesium in the soil will do next to nothing. So the placement of Epsom salt in the soil just won't be uptaken or utilized. It'll just get washed out of the soil system for the most part. Now, when it comes to foliar application, which is a totally different mechanism of uptaking magnesium, and that is because the leaves themselves are what is uptaking the nutrients. Now, stomata plays a small role in this, but the other one is actually just the leaf itself. And of course, plants have a little bit of a cuticle layer on top, which protects them from water and disease and all that fun stuff. So in some cases, some plants are better at uptaking magnesium through a foliar spray than others. And you can visually usually see this because if it's a really waxy, thick leaf, probably a good indication of a really thick cuticle and someone that would have, or something that would have, I mean, I treat plants like humans too, but something that would have issues uptaking that foliar spray. So we know the mechanism where magnesium can be uptaken via foliar spray will result in excess magnesium, if you will, being uptaken and more than what our roots generally would be capable of. And that's because it's almost like a forked forced mechanism, if you will. The way in which foliars get into leaves actually isn't just water and then the fertilizer. It's a little bit more intense than that. Number one, plants have cuticles, just like your girl has a beautiful manicure here. Actually, my nails don't look that bad right now. They're normally like disgusting. I, I showered, I showered this morning. So. Win for me. Any hoosers, the cuticle on a plant is Thick. So to break into the cuticle, if you will, there's a few things that need to be considered. So number one is actually a surfactant. Dawn dish soap is a detergent. I've done videos on that, so don't use that, but there are a number of surfactants. I'll pop them up here because I'd never be able to say them all. There's you know, yucca plant is a natural one. Coconut oil is a natural one. The second way in which it's uptaken and we can actually hack the system is through changing the pH of the actual spray we're using. Seedlings or small, young, immature plants, if you will, well, benefit from a pH of eight. Now, adults, they actually like something on the more acidic side at around a 6.2 to seven pH. Okay, the last factor is actually including other nutrients. Magnesium is uptaken through the leaves on its face, like on its own, without anything added other than the pH adjustment and obviously the surfactant. It tends to be absorbed a little bit better when there's a party involved. Kind of like me, I absorb brewskis, if you will, a little bit better when there's a party. Now, what I will say here is that the time of day in which you apply really does not matter. Two reasons why. Remember how I said stomata wasn't the main mechanism for uptake? Well, that means that the morning and the evenings aren't necessarily the best time to do it. Number two, the idea that water burns leaves is a myth. That is a false, that's a false thing. This is not real. Water does not burn leaves. You can fight me in the comments for that one. If you apply it through foliar with all of those items in consideration and you've maximized uptake and now you're officially absorbing an excessive amount of magnesium, what does it do to your plant? This is where people argue and I want you to look at science, plant science, soil science, horticulture as something fun and exciting, not dogmatic. So there's gonna be people who disagree with this. And then there's gonna be people who think that this is kind of a neat way to look at it and maybe something that they'd wanna investigate on their own. Be your own garden scientist. Don't listen to a book. Don't listen to me. Do whatever you want. Statement number one is that magnesium does nothing in regards to biomass accumulation, chlorophyll increases, and just overall plant health in excess. What I found, however, and this is where science is fun, gardening is fun, 
they have found in this study in particular soybean and maize i said i know i usually don't hold paper sorry adhd brain i don't usually hold paper but my phone is really hard to look at without glasses and the glare of the sun so I've, I've decided this is the best way to do it. This was done on soybean and maize crops, and this was done, this is very important to consider, this is done in a soil without limitations of magnesium, meaning the magnesium was tested in the soil, we know it's there, we know it's bioavailable, the plants are only getting excess magnesium from the foliar applications. And what their results were, was that foliar magnesium supplementa supplementation, I went to university, I promise, increased the net photosynthetic rate and stomatal conductance, reduced the substomatal CO2 concentrations and leaf transpiration, you name it. All that means, and all you need to care about, is that it increased photosynthesis and it made plants stronger against oxidative stressors. And those two things combined made what they call a more metabolically active plant, which is a good thing, kind of like me. I would benefit from being more met metabolically active, but um, here we are, still got my winter fluff. The next one is actually on beets. So again, this was in an application where the magnesium was bioavailable to the beets, ready to go. And a lot of, you know, one section of scientists do believe that excessive amounts of magnesium being applied does nothing. So keep that in mind. They may have found nothing in this study and it's all a lie. So what they found is that the chlorophyll within the beets did increase when magnesium was applied. And this resulted in two things. Number one, more biomass accumulation in the roots. And number two, biomass accumulation in the leaves. Now, the other thing that they did find in this was actually that the sugar content in the beets increased as well, which is something we care about in the world of beets, but in you know other plants, we don't. Fruits, you probably care about sugar content, but magnesium in excess did show some really great results. Now, the next one is actually on bananas. And you're probably like, Ashley, why are you picking all these really like different crops? I just want to show you that the ultimately the effects we see of excessive amounts of magnesium being applied doesn't just apply to, you know, one or two plants. It's actually kind of a universal uptake benefit type scenario. So banana plants was the next one and they found and they were they were purely testing for chlorophyll here in this case. But what they found was that the chlorophyll was increased and that the chlorophyll fluorescence in the leaves actually were also increased. So overall, just an increase in chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is responsible for photosynthesis and photosynthesis is responsible for giving their booties that they have um, and your bounty that you recover from their booty. But, oof, my goodness, sometimes Ashley, what do you do? Do you put Epsom salt in a spray bottle and spray your plants? What ratio do you use? Do you mix it with coconut water? I don't know, to be honest, only because I don't know what Epsom salt you have. I don't know how much magnesium is in your Epsom salt. I would hate for you to over apply it in your soil or your plants and cause problems because I told you that. Do I think that you should just go ahead and not choose to foliar apply this? No, I think that if you wanted to, you could apply it to one or two plants, see if it works, apply the theory to practice, and if it works for you, wonderful. I'm not gonna tell you what concentration to do it in because I don't want you to hurt your plants. And to be honest, if you just didn't do it, which is what I'm gonna do is just not do it because I don't really care that much. At least you learned something today. And at least when next time you see that reel or that short, you don't have to send it to me. I send it to all your friends and be like, this is why she did it. And she's, she's not wrong. If you wanna learn more about the soil test you can do for compaction, which can also actually affect magnesium and all nutrient uptake, you're gonna wanna check out this video right here.